Another way we as Christians should stand up to the current status quo is in foreign policy. Reagan, in one of his earliest speeches, said, the record of history is clear. Citizens of the U.S. resort to force reluctantly and only when we must. Eisenhower, the great general, expressed it similarly. He said, our foreign policy is not difficult to state. We are for peace, first, last, and always. Reagan believed in strength, but he also believed in peace. He wrote, as, the enemies, as for the enemies of freedom, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. Our reluctance for conflict should not be misjudged as a failure of will. When action is required to preserve our national security, we will act. Reagan spoke often of peace through strength. But I, see, I fear that some in our nation and some in our party have forgotten the first part of the sentence. That peace should be our goal even as we build our strength. Some in my party have distorted this belief in peace through strength into a misguided belief that we should project strength through war. Even when we've tried through good intentions to make the world a better place, our actions have often backfired. Jesus reminds us what our goal should be when he proclaims, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. This doesn't mean we won't defend ourselves. If attacked, it is our duty to defend your family, to defend your country, to defend our freedom. During the Iraq war, though, think of what happened. A quarter of a million Iraqi Christians fled Iraq. They feared the Shiite government that's there now that we helped put in place after Saddam. They fled in droves by the hundreds of thousands. Where did they go? They headed mostly for Syria, joining over a million Syrians who have lived as Christians since the time of Christ. Now President Obama is, no applause please, sorry. Now President Obama is arming Islamic rebels in Syria. The vast majority of Christians in Syria though are on the opposite side of the war. We are arming Islamic rebels that are intent on killing Christians. One recent massacre stands out from others. In 2013, Islamic marauders invaded the little town of Malula, an ancient Christian city where they still speak Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. The villagers have been Christian since the time of Christ. As the Islamic rebels swarmed into town, they demanded that everyone convert to Islam or die. Sarki El Zakam, a brave young man, stood up and answered them and he said, I am a Christian and if you must kill me, do it. Those were his last words. Elsewhere in Syria, Islamic rebels have filmed beheadings of their captives. Two Christian bishops have been kidnapped and one priest killed. There is an irony that is impossible to escape. Our tax dollars are funding Islamic rebels who are killing Christians. Now they will say, oh, we're only giving it to the moderate rebels. I defy them to tell me that they can tell with certainty who they're giving the weapons to. In Pakistan, Asia Bibi sits on death row because she's a Christian. She's been there five years. In Iran, Saeed Abedini suffers in a prison because he is a Christian. American tax dollars are often flowing to countries that are doing this. Pakistan's gotten billions of dollars while persecuting Christians. There's a war on Christianity going on, and sometimes you're being asked to pay for it. I say not one penny to any country that persecutes Christians.